we just got a massive amount of news about the college football 25 gameplay a trailer released as well as an over 30 page document i'm gonna break it all down here but before we get into all of it i just want to mention i am not affiliated with ea all opinions are my own however i have played the game early so i do have some insight and some opinions about some things in game in a trailer like this it also lets us see some things visually that we haven't been able to talk about before like first you'll notice off the score bug or the scoreboard whatever you want to call it at the bottom it's not like espn license in this game but it is a generic one that actually looks good you know i'm not a fan of the the madden ones that look super super bland and they just like take up a tremendous amount of space on the top of the screen this is not obtrusive at the bottom i do kind of miss the like records underneath the team names i'm not sure that if that's going to be in dynasty or not there is a ticker at the bottom like in dynasty i mean there's that space underneath the scoreboard for that so i would imagine in my head that it would be down there the wide splits are going to be insane like rpos with this is going to be ridiculous and i think that's one reason why I like the wide hash marks in college make it such a massively different game compared to the nfl because you can get away with plays like this one thing i will say from my gameplay experience is you definitely notice these unique throwing animations i'd say definitely like on the run or when like when people are blitzing you you can kind of see them on those kind of final two ones they look a little like i would say a little bit awkward kind of like a college football player would because not all of those guys have pristine mechanics they're not all destined to be nfl stars you know so i thought it was a nice touch and helped it separate from madden quite a bit so this deep dive was written by scott o'gallagher the design director for ea sports college football 25 and there's so much information i have to get through so i'm going to try to get through it as quickly as possible first off they talk about campus iq and something they call all 22 plus the way he mentions this it's the differentiation of talent between the best and worst players in college football, which is like massively different from the NFL. Like the best player in the NFL and the worst player in the NFL, there's not as a big of a gap as the best player in college football and the worst player in college football. He also mentioned 134 ways to play, representing every team's offensive schemes they pulled from pro football focus to try and match real life schemes as closely as possible. Then he goes on to mention stories of Saturday, basically talking about composure here. True freshmen were gonna respond differently compared to like a seasoned senior, which we'll touch more on that later. Now, a lot of people have mentioned the stick work in this game and described it as explosive gameplay. They said they studied a lot of tape of current and former college football legends to try and recreate that explosiveness of the college football game. They mentioned they want you to be able to play north and south as well as east and west. They said the way they do that is with all new specific run styles for different archetypes in College Football 25. I will say one of the most intriguing new features is wear and tear. So this definitely reminds me of a feature in Head Coach 09 where you have different body parts that have different like health ratings. So in this game, it works as more of like a damage system. So let's say your quarterback gets hit in the throwing arm. You could be losing throw power, throw accuracy, carrying, that sort of thing. I think what's going to be intriguing about this system is, or kind of my fear is like, I don't want it to be too aggressive. I don't want my players constantly hurt. I do want to have to manage my players, but I, I think when I was talking to the developer, he made sure that this is not going to like have a tremendous amount of injuries. It's more about trying to focus about management and spreading the ball around. Like sliding with your quarterback when you're scrambling out would be a smarter decision or throwing the ball away instead of taking that sack. Now, if you get hit a lot in the same area, his overall could tank quite a bit. So if he gets sacked like four times in a row on his throwing arm, he's going to be banged up. I mentioned that there can be damages to the throwing arms, but there can be damages to all sorts of body parts. For example, if you get damage to the legs, that affects change of direction and acceleration, which would make every movement feel slower. Players' toughness ratings can play a critical role in how much damage is applied on a given hit. The more damage the body part, the higher chance of severity of injury. You can recover players and they can regain health when they are not on the field. So you sub them out and during timeouts, you can give them a small little recovery boost. At halftime, they'll recover and in between weeks. However, the worse a body part is damaged, the slower it recovers. A player can recover a limited amount of damage during a single game. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean he's injured right away. You can still play him. You just need to be more careful. Maybe spread the ball out a little bit more. You can also sub him out or call a timeout. However, if his ratings are like incredibly low and he's super banged up, you might want to look to sub him out. As you can see in the screenshot, Mafa for Clemson, he looks like severely banged up. So in his case, you might want to bench him for a little bit, give him some rest, let him recover for a second. 
They also mentioned that this system can bleed over week to week in Dynasty mode and in Road to Glory. It says in Road to Glory it's going to be a huge part of the gameplay experience, which they will talk more about in the Road to Glory deep dive. You can see the wear and tear system on the player reticle on the left side. On the right bar you can see fatigue. It says the bars depleting only represent the most hurt body part. It's on the panel on the bottom right of the player card as well as the total and attribute is decreasing is in the spreadsheet. You can also see it on Coach Vision. You can hold left trigger and right stick. You can hold left trigger and push the right stick down to see wear and tear status of your entire team. And it says that players will have a variety of wear and tear get up animations. Like you might be grabbing your arm or something if you got hit in the arm. Might be grabbing the leg if you got hit in the leg or something. It says you can also manage wear and tear in the Dynasty player card set. I did talk to Scott personally when I was down in Orlando, and he told me that this system does not necessarily result in more injuries, which is what I would be afraid of. Because I was not a fan of the Madden like fatigue systems where players are off the field all the time, and I was confused at why. He pushed it more as like this system is meant to be more dynamic and encouraging you to spread the ball around. Like not every running back can carry the ball 30 times a game kind of thing. There are certain ones who can, but they would need a specific archetype, which we'll talk about later, to be able to do something like that. And if you're reckless and you completely ignore the warning signs of wear and tear, it could cost you. Like if you drop back to pass every time, you're going to put your quarterback at risk, especially if your offensive line is bad and you're getting sacked all the time. To try and keep your players healthy, I think this system is encouraging you to have a balanced play style. That way everyone is fresh. And I think this system is also pushing you to be more active in your roster management. Like maybe your running back three actually gets carries this time around. Like he would probably never do that in NCAA 14. Or your wide receiver four or five might get some reps just so the starters can get some rest which I think overall is a good feature, but we'll see how it actually plays in game. And they also said that the fatigue has been completely overhauled. That's probably good because the Madden fatigue system was booty cheeks. It says wear and tear accounts for physical impacts. Fatigue is primarily a conditioning feature. It's designed to provide more realistic snap counts at the college level. It's something to pay attention to on a drive to drive basis. Let's say a running back gets three consecutive carries for positive yards. You may notice them huffing and puffing in pre-play. On a subsequent carry, they'll likely come out of the game. Recovery has been changed to where it'll likely be only for a single play. Moving on, they're talking about the option game. So some of this stuff was leaked, but to sum it up quickly, the mechanics now mimic real life quarterback and running back exchanges on option plays. In NCAA 14, the option mechanics worked where if you didn't touch the button at all, your quarterback would pull the ball and you would run with the quarterback. You would have to hold down the button to hand it to the running back. That is completely flip-flopped here in this game. The mechanics are now supposed to mimic real life quarterback and running back exchanges. So when you hold down the button, the quarterback's going to pull the ball, and if you don't touch anything, it's going to hand it off to the running back. There's also two different types of pitches in this game. You can quick tap to execute a quick pitch, and holding down the button will result in a strong pitch. He said quick pitches are useful in tight spots, however, it might not hit the ball carrier in stride and will slow him down. A strong pitch, on the other hand, is used when there's ample space between you and the approaching defender. It requires more time, but offers more precise accuracy and velocity. You can also fake pitch if you want by double tapping the bumper. For RPOs, if you don't touch anything at all, the quarterback will hand the ball off as well. And in an RPO scenario, if you want to bail from the read and run it, you can press A or X. And if you want to hit the receiver, you can simply press that receiver's corresponding button immediately to throw the ball. And if you want to keep the ball with the quarterback on an RPO, the type of RPO dictates whether you can read slash peek or if you can't alert slash glance. Something interesting here too is new control around when the quarterback will branch out of his like option movement to where he's holding the ball forward. You know what I'm talking about? So if you hold right trigger or R2 when a couple yards past the line of scrimmage, you'll branch out into standard ball carrier movement. This is kind of something that I felt like was annoying in NCAA 14. I'm glad they focused on it here because I don't like it with how the quarterbacks almost always felt slower simply because they were quarterbacks. You should be able to run normally like they're still a human being. Hopefully that works out in this game. They said they also added animations for pitches and catches as well as well as pitching the ball while being tackled. He says the defense is seeing significant upgrades. For example, new AI logic for the read and pitch keys. It says they consider more realistic context when deciding to crash or stay at home. For instance, they're more likely to stay at home or, or basically play the quarterback when you're on the wide hash marks. Conversely, when the offense is close to the first down, they'll play the running back more often. Often. Basically, they try to target the space that seems most obvious that you would want to go to. So you're going to have to be ready and flexible when you're playing the option. They said pitch keys exhibit more varied behavior. With the ability to bluff 
whether they're playing the quarterback or the running back. So hopefully that means it's not the same animation every time where a guy like stands up or just like kind of jogs to the running back. We'll see how that plays out. And under coaching adjustments, rather than a standard like option defense setting, you can instruct read and pitch keys separately on how to defend. Something I found interesting is the ability to disguise coverages. So the example they use is they're in cover two, but they've morphed it to look like they're closing in the middle of the field, completely disguising the coverage. There's probably disadvantages to this because like your guys are not in the ideal position right from the get go, but you have the advantage of them not knowing exactly what you're doing, unless their quarterback has some very specific abilities at high levels, which we'll talk about later. It's a good way to be sneaky and I'm glad it's in this game. It says before the snap, you also have the option to showcase a single high or two high, depending on the formation you've chosen. Just more options to disguise your coverages, which seems fun. It says, but be careful with these. If a defensive back has low composure, there's risk he might mess up the disguise look. So does that mean he's just like sitting in the normal position? I'm not sure. And I think that's what I really like about these this gameplay deep dive. It's so in depth and there's so many like details that I didn't even think about. But moving forward, let's talk about abilities. So thankfully there's not like automatically triggering abilities like X Factor for Madden or anything that breaks the game to be honest. It says in this game there's 80 abilities and I think these mainly work kind of like badges would work in 2Ks is how I would describe it. He says a majority of these are brand new to the football gaming space which is awesome. He says these are, are situational boosts and once again not automatically triggering like X factors. No guarantees. These abilities go from bronze, silver, gold and at the highest level they can be platinum. A player can max out at five physical abilities and three mental abilities. Each ability he wants to provide players with increasing depth as they progress through these tiers. And I'll explain those here. For, so if like for example there's an ability called Grip Breaker which is a physical ability that bolsters a defender's capability to disengage from a block. At bronze and silver tiers, this ability only applies to running plays. However, at the gold and platinum tiers, it also applies to passing plays as well, while also having its effects significantly amplified. Physical abilities a player can have is determined by their archetype, while mental abilities are determined by their position. Got a few examples from the screenshot here. Workhorse, which gives you better protection from wear and tear effects when colliding with other players. This makes me think a power back with a platinum in the workhorse would be a tank because it says at the high end you have ultimate protection at the the low end like bronze you only have slight protection so you see how this goes up the staircase basically in terms of the power of the ability you can see another example of this at the lowest level for option king you only have a slight accuracy increase in quick pitches silver you got moderate accuracy on quick pitches and you have a speed increase on strong pitches but let's go all the way to the top level of option king you have ultimate speed accuracy increase on pitches and you also now have have wear and tear protection on option plays. So I guess those service academies might have some like pretty good option kings on their team if they're going to be able to run these options all the dang time. And you also got to think about your scheme. You can't just like throw in a pocket passer and run the option and expect to have success all the time. Like clearly if he doesn't have the wear and tear protection, he's going to be hurt a lot more. Another ability, downhill. It's another physical ability and you have the better chance to break tackles when hitting top speed. Again, this seems to be for power backs in my head. Think about an NCAA 14, you would see like running backs with like 80 speed. And I'd be like, when do I ever use these guys in that game? Like speed killed in NCAA 14. It was the meta all the time. However, with abilities like this, let's say he has 80 speed, but 99 acceleration. He's going to hit top speed so quickly. And then when you're running at top speed here, you're going to have a higher chance to break tackles. So he's just running into people, barreling into them. That'd be his most prime game style. And at the top end, with his ultimate ability, you only need to hit 80% of your max speed. So it might be like, I don't know exactly how long it takes to get to your max speed in this game. Let's say it takes you like 10, 15 yards. So basically every first down run, this guy's got a good chance to break a tackle. But again, he said no guarantee. So it's just a slight situational boost. Let's say you combo downhill with workhorse. You got yourself a superstar in your hands. Which I think is fun because I don't know if I've ever really been able to make power backs work in my games. At least going back to like NCAA 14. Finally, the first mental ability I've seen here, Field General. This one seems to be for quarterbacks because you can identify blitzers pre-snap at the lower levels and on the higher levels, 
levels, you can identify pre-snap coverages. And at the platinum level, you can even di see disguise coverages. I did notice some people were kind of annoyed that you would be able to see what coverage shells they're running because they think it's like basically training wheels for people who don't know football. But I mean, if it's a disguise coverage, now there's kind of a use for this. So at the platinum tier, those guys become incredibly valuable because if it's a disguise coverage, I don't know how you would automatically know that that's like say a cover four, for example, if they're showing a cover zero blitz. But if you got this ability, you're going to be able to see it before the snap and adjust accordingly. He says they wanted to keep the gameplay balance at the forefront, though. So, for example, with the pocket shield ability, this progressively makes offensive linemen hold blocks better on standard pass plays. However, the platinum of this ability does not apply if the distance to the first down is more than 10 yards. So if it's 4th and 40, it's not going to do anything for you. And that's why these are all meant to be very specific situational boosts. It's not an all-time thing. He says even if you have like the top tier of a lot of abilities, you still have a chance to lose a rep. Again, no guarantees of success, which I think is good. Coaches also have abilities with gameplay effects. And these are going to be expanded on even more in the Dynasty Deep Dive, which I cannot wait for. I gotta have some more info on Dynasty, man. I love it. My favorite mode. But anyways, these abilities will have significant impacts on major features such as confidence and composure, home field advantage, and play styles, to name a few. Here we can see Travis Hunter and a look at a bunch of different abilities. It doesn't seem like there's going to be too many guys in the Platinum tier either, so it's just like incredibly rare and only for like the elite of the elite. And there's so many abilities in this game. Like this is a massive list we see right here. You can look more in depth into it if you want and try and speculate in the comments below. I'm curious to see what some of these might mean. But it's nice to know that a lot of these are unique that we've never seen before. I would have been kind of annoyed if they just copy and pasted kind of thing. Pre-snap recognition. So this is designed to bring a level of clarity to the line of scrimmage, he said. It's meant to be reflecting the experience of the player controlling the game. So for instance, a freshman player may not be able to identify who is coming to blitz or what shell coverage is at the line of scrimmage compared to what a seasoned senior would recognize. The system takes into account player and coach abilities, home field advantage, all of which impact what a player can see at the line of scrimmage. Field general, which we just mentioned, affects this. I'll break it down more in depth here. So at the bronze level, blitzes are highlighted, but only after the snap. So you have a basic level of awareness. That's about it. At the silver tier, players can spot blitzes before the snap, but only if they're close to the line of scrimmage and only for a brief moment. So it's a slight edge, but not much. Gold. It unveils a covered shell momentarily, giving a glimpse of the defense. That's clearly an advantage. But at the platinum one, like we said earlier, this is a massive advantage. So you can even see disguised covered shells only briefly, though. So it's not on the screen the entire time. This is designed to ensure that the defensive player can also make adjustments strategically in response. So if they know you got a platinum quarterback with those abilities, they're not like completely screwed, which is good to know. It's going to be like a chess match the entire time, which is fun. Football is kind of like that anyway. Confidence and composure. College football specifically it's not only about the most skilled players but it's also who can maintain their composure in high pressure situations confidence and composure is about moment to moment gameplay he says players can get hot and cold depending on the outcome of each play and experience plays a critical role in that freshmen will have more volatile swings than a senior and crowd level can affect players confidence increases progressively Rivalry games, the composure effects are even higher. Specific events like touchdowns can lift morale of the entire team. Individual plays like a pass breakup can significantly boost the composure of the player who made the big play. Composure is highly individualized, driven by a player's archetype. For instance, when your player starts to cook, quote unquote, a scrambling quarterback will have improved ball security, while field general will have benefit from improved throw accuracy. Unique mental abilities influence their composure. Abilities can affect their teammates for certain position groups. So like the Legion ability, kind of making a reference to the Legion of Boom, I guess, increases the confidence of other defensive backs when that player gets an interception. However, these abilities benefits can be lost at any time if a player gets cold. We did mention earlier, coaching abilities can play an important role in composure as well but those once again will be mentioned more in depth in the dynasty deep dive blog which again i can't wait for that Let's talk about coach vision. So this is like your pre-snap info. You can use the sticks to look at wear and tear. Composure and confidence, which is like the red bar, suggests your player is starting to cook, quote unquote. A blue indicator shows a player is getting cold. And if they have a flame or snowflake icon, that means they've reached the maximum in one of those areas. You can also look at player's abilities. And it looks like you can do that by each specific position group. You can also see the matchups, which they said they simplified this to basically mean green for a favorable matchup, yellow for an even matchup, and red for a disadvantage We're not even halfway people but here we are at home field advantage you'll notice right away it, this is a reference right back to ncaa's 06 with the state
Stadium Pulse. Some of the top ranked environments to play in in college football. I think LSU had the highest rated stadium, like toughest place to play rating when we played, but they said they also brought back the like similar screen shake from NCAA 06. You'll notice audio and in-game modifiers, which is things we've seen before, like squiggly lines, but you also have play art appearing incorrectly. Audibles and hot routes might fail to register. Receiver icons might fade out the farther they get away from you, especially in more critical moments in the game. So this makes it so your initial play call before you start doing audibles and hot routes is even more important, especially when you're in a hostile environment and you're the road team, because it's just harder to communicate in those environments. It, it makes sense. You also have the classic like pump up the crowd thing with the right stick. We, we come to expect those kind of things. But I will say the audio in this game for the, the stadium mixes is just insane. It's by far the best I've ever heard in a video game. And I think college football is without a doubt the best atmosphere of any football you can find. It says home field advantage only affects the visiting team and it's only situation based. Staying within manageable down and distances is vital to successfully moving the ball downfield, he says. And as the game situation gets tougher, the crowd noise intensifies, which is cool. I cannot wait for like a fourth quarter, very close game on the road. I'm just, I'm just like itching to play this in like a dynasty mode, especially like when I'm an underdog team and this could be like my first upset of them. Oh, I can't wait. Some more cool things is in the pre-play controls. You have like 12 potential hot routes and you don't need an ability to use them. So if you want to add like a deep cross on there, deep dig, you can add a post route. Been wanting to do that for years. You also have the ability to have custom stems on your routes. So you can modify by like a single yard at a time or five yard increments and you can update those routes in real time. I mean, you could honestly scheme up some crazy plays with this. So there's no like create a play feature in game necessarily, but with this many hot routes and this custom stem stuff, there's a lot you could do, but you're also beholden to the play clock. So try not to get too many delay of game penalties especially on the road in crazy environments. A big feature that you'll notice right away is the revamped passing. So just a little anecdote. Um, when I was playing, I, I had like a, a corner route with my tight end. I was able to layer the football perfectly over the linebacker. There was not a leaping linebacker in this situation. And the ball got there before the safety could get there. So it was just like a nice little, the ball trajectory was exactly what I wanted to be. Floated it over him right into the tight end's hands for the, a beautiful catch. It was a nice play and I felt satisfied with that the way it played out it felt like very football-y you know what i mean sometimes things can feel too video gamey but that one felt nice and continuing on with the passing mechanics, uh, Scott was really adamant about saying throw power is more than just like I throw the ball far attribute. It's it's really more about the velocity of how quarterbacks can get in there quickly, which is good to know because like even when you're scouting quarterbacks coming from college to the NFL, like it's one thing you look for is more of the zip. So on the start of a pass, you'll see three colors, blue, yellow, and red. The sizes of each of those sections depend on a couple different factors. So like your quarterback's attributes, abilities, how far is the throw and other factors that might impact the accuracy, such as if you're being pressured, if you're throwing off of your back foot, if you're throwing on the run, etc. So if you land in the blue, this increases the chances of a safe, accurate ball. It says if you land in the yellow, it could mean uncertainty from the ideal target. Not entirely sure what that means. Red areas could indicate potential inaccuracy. The longer you stay in the red, the greater the penalty, it says. They also said this kind of throwing mechanic was basically inspired inspired by MVP Baseball 05, which a lot of people said they liked that throwing system in that game. It says, keep in mind that not all red sections are equal. Quarterbacks with weaker arms or lower accuracy ratings will have much larger red sections. So trying to push the ball downfield consistently with weak arm quarterbacks, not a good idea, dude don't do it. They also mentioned something called the switch stick. So when you're lurking in pass coverage, you can flick the right stick. This will directionally switch to the coverage to the other defenders according to the direction you flick. Now, I will say when I try to use this mechanic playing myself, uh, it took me a while to get used to it. And I still don't think I was by the, the time I finished playing. I only played a couple of hours though, so maybe I need more reps. But you also got to keep in mind, personally, I've been awful at defense in literally every video game I've ever played. So I might not be the best source of information on that. They said they have 1,500 new plays. 50 formations, 134 team playbooks. They even have the very odd long mesh from Wake Forest, which you've ever, if you've ever seen a, a game of Wake Forest these past couple years when the way they run that, it's one of the weirdest offenses I've ever seen. So I'm impressed that they got it into this game. They have 10 non-team playbooks based around air raid, 
multiple pistol, all those kind of things. Custom playbooks is returning in this one. You can use any of the plays and from anybody else's playbook. You can't create a play specifically, but we already saw how many hot routes you can use, so you can still get crazy with those. So there's potential for a lot of different combos. They did touch on trick plays, which seems kind of fun. I like to do those every now and then. DIY reversed. You can decide whether or not to hand off to your teammate or keep the ball and run. There's also a halfback direct DIY reverse. You got the double pass reverse, the reverse pass, the reverse flea flicker. I mean, all these sound kind of fun. I want to be able to see them in game. However, you can't just spam these plays all the time. It says the defense will adapt, making these calls a much riskier option. So I bet you have to use them just like once in a blue moon thing, just kind of how like normal teams use them. Glance RPOs give players the ability to read a safety to the side of the glance route, which is a, a short post. He said the game is filled with RPOs. It's, it's a very common thing of the college game, so it's no surprise. And with them having so many RPOs, he wanted to give the defense the ability to counter these RPOs. So defenders away from the run action will prioritize their pass responsibilities, and defenders are more aggressive in fending off blocks from incoming receivers. Run fit defenders are capable of responding to the run action more rapidly, enabling them to come downhill and make the stop. You will see wide formation splits from teams like Oklahoma and Tennessee, a characteristic of veer and shoot play styles. Flexbone option offense features base plays such as triple option, midline, rocket toss, counter option, and zone drive. On the defensive side, playbooks assigned to teams include 3-2-6, 3-4, 3-4 multiple, 3-3-5, 3-3-5 tight, 4-2-5, 4-3, 4-3 multiple, and multiple. So there's actually like two no huddle kind of styles in this game. A normal no huddle, players will rush to the line offering the traditional tempo when holding down Y or triangle, the one you're used to. But there's a new one called Turbo. This is aimed to speed up gameplay. They're like rapidly rushing to the line. It says it's activated by holding down X or square. And they said that this is inspired by fast paced offenses, like in which cases defenses aren't able to fully set and defensive line is slower off the ball. And he says this is kind of a gamble though, cause you're trading the ability to audible and hot route. And he says you can use like the spike features out of any formation. So it's not like uh, you're constantly having to audible to get there, which makes sense. Like, in real life, they don't care what formation they're in. They're just like, come on, let's spike the ball. CPU teams now exhibit distinctive identities in their tempo usage. Teams like Oklahoma, for instance, adopt an up-tempo strategy for most of the game, possibly calling for a shot play after securing a first down in certain areas of the field at a fast pace. Conversely, teams like Michigan may only resort to this move following a significant play to jumpstart the offense when losing. This next part is something I've been waiting on for a long time. AI decision-making when it comes to clock management and timeout usage has also undergone substantial revision to more accurately mirror the strategic decision-making of real-life coaches, which is, if you've played any EA game in the past, like 2,000 years, they have never been good at making decisions late in games, which bugged me and really drove me up the wall. And like I mentioned earlier, both players and the AI can now initiate a spike from any alignment. And another thing, this game will have like the two minute warning, which is a part of college football now, which will be interesting to see in the college game. And in situations where players or the AI are about to audible, players will glance towards the sideline, which is kind of cool because that's a big thing at the college game. They hold up all these posters with like weird looking symbols on them. However, this happens on both offense and defense. And like, let's say you snap the ball while the defenders are looking at the sidelines. This could cause them to be slower off the ball. It also says players will physically walk to the line and officials are gonna be spotting the ball as well. So like in the past couple of years in Madden, it would just kind of like, like if you were gonna do hurry up, it quickly simulates and you're immediately back at your new destination where your new spot is in the seconds that would happen in between just went away, which I thought was kind of annoying. I want to see my players get up there. I want to feel like the pressure of like, will I be able to get another snap off before this game is over? I don't want it to just waste away in the background. Real-time coaching, adaptive coaching engine to enhance CPU gameplay on both sides of the ball. Coach aggressiveness has unique adaptive adjustment levels. Different coaches will react and adapt differently to successful run or pass games. He says this makes every game unpredictable and dynamic, which sounds nice in theory, Hopefully every coach and every team plays differently. The CPU now has a full range of adjustments, just like human players would make, which is cool. Like for example, they can have shade techniques. They can show blitz, run commits, QB contains, QB spies, just to name a few. And the AI will also adapt to whatever offensive personnel you have on the field. If you're dominating with an inside zone out of an 11 personnel, you'll notice the CPU 
tweaking their defensive line to try and shut that down. But they said different teams will adjust at different rates. The AI is aware of your player ratings and abilities. If you have an elite wideout, some teams might double cover him right from the jump. Other teams might match him with their top corner. The computer can also disguise coverages, making the gameplay more challenging. Situational adjustments are things he described as pre-snap chess matches. So for example, when you're inside the 10, expect the computer to press you inside shade techniques to try and force the ball the sidelines and over the top. They got a pass protection mechanic, which provides six pass protection targeting schemes. Through matchup lines, you can see which player the lineman is supposed to pick up. It'll be like a green line directly looking at him. Indicators will also pop up for unblocked defenders, which will be red. It says they added 400 blocking animations. And they said these cover both open field blocking as well as pass blocking and run blocking at the point of attack and engagements. They said it helps deliver an aggressive and powerful experience in the trenches. For the defense, the pass rush and run stopping power of the defense has also seen a significant upgrade. The ability for pass rushers to play more pass rush moves and more often has been increased. It says this improvement is backed with new animations. Similarly, defenders now have an increased ability to play more shed moves in the run game, which is also supported with new animations. Another key focus of development, they said, was the targeting systems for the fundamental blocking schemes, such as inside and outside zones. He says the aim here is to increase a user's ability to predict the outcome of targeting and be confident that the defenders who need to get picked up will get targeted. Now let's move on to weather effects. But it says the weather now plays a significant role in influencing the outcome of a game, and the effects are far from subtle. Harsh weather conditions affect the movement of your players. So like if it's pouring outside, it's going to be challenging to plant and cut in these conditions. And it says the passing game faces considerable impact when playing under harsh conditions as well. Players will have noticeably wobbly passes. You're going to have impacted pass accuracy and throw power are some of the other gameplay elements affected by weather. The chances of increased drops and fumbles also rise under adverse weather conditions. The ball becomes slippery and harder to hold on to, increasing the risk of turnovers. This aspect means that players will have to be extra cautious and probably going to want to use that cover ball mechanic by using the right bumper or R1 more often. Weather will also make base wrap and dive tackling a bit more challenging as well. Lastly, weather impacts special teams. You'll see it'll affect your kick power and kick accuracy. Kicking the ball in heavy rain or snow can drastically alter its trajectory and distance, making field goals and punts a challenging task. He also talks about the little things, like new one-foot catch animations, which are triggered by possession catches near the sidelines. It says play action is more effective on first downs and short yardage situations. That makes sense to my brain. So kicking ratings determine the meter. Lower rated kickers have smaller green zones to work with. And this like football goes back and forth here and you're trying to target the, the football in the middle where it's green. The larger the distance of the kick, the faster the bar sways back and forth. So if it's a 60 yard kick, that thing's gonna be moving. To make a kick, you get the ball centered. Hold down A or X after you do that. And what you're trying to target is right before you get to this red spot at the top of this arrow. If you go into the red, it's considered an overkick. So overkicking could potentially give you the distance you need, but at a potential cost. Like you're probably gonna have a little bit of an accuracy penalty by doing this. So you gotta weigh the risk and reward. You'll also notice the camera is more pulled back to look more like a TV broadcast angle, which is nice. They also talk about some celebration systems in game. So this kind of works like, uh, it kind of reminds me of like the old FIFA 13 game celebrations. You know, like where the play ends, Let's say you scored a touchdown. You have the ability to like put your right stick in a direction and you can celebrate that way. You can also modify it with the left bumper or left trigger or the right bumper or right trigger as well. They said there is 20 different touchdown celebrations, four interception celebrations, four first down celebrations. Some of the options include you can taunt the crowd by putting your hand over your ear. You can do the Heisman pose, which is nice. And I believe I saw someone doing the gritty as a celebration one time when we were playing. And the final feature he's gonna be touching upon here is called victory formation. So when the game is mathematically over, you can take a knee, players will come onto the field and the following kneel downs will be simulated. But one little note from Scott near the end, he says, they've been looking at wish lists from forums, creators, social media. I talked to 
some of the dev team, they said they personally watch my wish list. So it's nice to know that it's being heard by somebody, at least. I can see some influences from what I said in that. Like I, I mentioned some of my favorite games. Head Coach 09 had like a wear and tear system. Uh, NCAA 06 had the stadium pulse, obviously. I mentioned some things about Team Builder, obviously. And there's many other things in this game that I saw were slipped in there. Whether it was from my feedback or just like generally them looking into it, I'm not sure. But make those wish lists, talk in those Reddit forums. These guys paid more attention than you probably expect. I've personally enjoyed my experience with this game, but if you're still not sold on to it, wait for the reviews later on. But yes, that's a very exhaustive deep dive, but I'm glad that they did it this way. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Anyways, I just want to say thank you guys so much for watching. You're all legends of my book and as for me, I am Drew Morris, Big Drewski, not the expert. And I'll see you guys in my next video. Peace.